Decision 2022, the race for Milwaukee mayor. Tonight, the two candidates debate. Sponsored by TMJ4 News. 620 WTMJ. WIS Politics. Milwaukee Business Journal. And Marquette University. Live from Marquette's Varsity Theater. Here are your moderators, Charles Benson and Shannon Sims. And good evening and welcome to tonight's debate. I'm Charles Benson. And I'm Shannon Sims. Tonight you will hear from the candidates who want to be Milwaukee's next mayor ahead of the April 5th election. We want to welcome the candidates and this is where the audience gets the chance to participate. So we want to begin by welcoming Acting Mayor Cavalier Johnson. Thank you. And we now want to welcome former Alderman Bob Donovan. Thank you both for being here. Now let's go over some of the rules. Candidates, you will get 60 seconds to answer a question and 30 seconds for any possible follow-up questions from us. Now, if a candidate runs over time, this is what you're going to hear. If an opponent refers to you in their answer, you will get 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Now, prior to the debate, we did draw names to determine who would get the first question or give the final closing statement. So it's been determined the first question is for Mr. Johnson. Our first topic, crime and public safety. It is the number one concern among voters and people who live and work in the city. Here's why. Just a few hours ago, Milwaukee police responded to a triple homicide. TMJ4 is reporting that three men were killed. This would bring Milwaukee's homicide rate for this year to 50. That's double the pace of what it was last year. So, Mr. Donovan, Mr. Johnson, residents are tired of the enough is enough speeches. They want measurable results. What is your plan in the first 100 days in office that will reduce people dying here in the city of Milwaukee to gun violence? Mr. Johnson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shannon and Charles, for the question. And it's an important one. Uh, look, I was at that scene uh, just earlier this afternoon. I got the chance to look into the eyes of mothers and aunts and other family members who lost loved ones due to senseless gun violence that we see uh, far too often in our city. And so in the first 100 days of my administration when elected mayor, this is what I'll do. Uh, I will go to Madison. I will have those conversations that I've been talking about throughout this entire campaign. It's so important that we rebuild the relationship that the city of Milwaukee has has with state government. Only then will, be, will, we, will, we, will we be in a position to get the resources necessary to adequately staff our police department and also have the relationships necessary to stem the tide of illegal guns on the streets of Milwaukee that result in things like we saw just this afternoon where three people were senselessly killed uh, in our city. Enough of that. This is too much. And we need to have a change in this city in order to stop things like that from happening. That's what I'll be doing. Mr. Donovan. Quite frankly, folks, I can't believe how bad things have become in the last two years. We have gutted the Milwaukee Police Department over a period of many years. We have reduced their manpower to a point where they simply cannot keep up. Having said that, we desperately need to fill the positions that have been cut. That won't happen in a hundred days, but that process needs to begin by the right guy sitting in the mayor's office. In addition to that, we truly need to address this problem that an atmosphere of lawlessness has taken over this city. And the criminal element feels that they are untouchable and will not be held accountable. We desperately need to work with the district attorney and our judges to begin that process of holding people accountable for their crimes. All right, I know people and voters, they're going to want specifics. So, Mr. Donovan, question to you. You're advocating a return to the neighborhood beat cop and stepping up efforts to recruit officers who live in the neighborhoods they serve. How will you accomplish this? And would you require or offer officers pay incentives to live in their beat neighborhoods? I think everything has to be on the table. 
we have a problem with recruiting of officers. That needs to be addressed. Nobody wants to be a police officer anymore, and in many ways you can't blame them for what they've had to put up with over these several years. Having said that, yes, I would want to work with uh, the MPA, with the League of Martin, with the Latino Police Officers Association. I want police officers back in schools, connecting in a positive way with our young people so that they have a good impression of police officers, which sadly, that's not happening enough. So, yeah, and we also need to take our show on the road, as many cities across America have, recruiting in other cities around the country to bring good officers to Milwaukee. But to answer your question, everything needs to be on the table. All right, well, let me just follow up on that, because you want to try to get these beat officers who are already in these neighborhoods. You want to recruit them. How are you going to do that? What is your convincing line to say, come join Milwaukee Police? Well... I've been an advocate of foot patrol and, and bicycle officers for years. That's the kind of policing. There's no better strategy for policing and improving police community relations. That same officer connecting with the public day in and day out, the uh, rapport that is built up, all of the uh, information that that officer is able to gain because they trust that officer. So, so you get 30 seconds uh, for a follow-up, so we'll try it next time, but that will be your answer for now. Thank you. All right, Mr. Johnson. You're advocating for hiring retired homicide detectives. How would you accomplish that at a time when many of the veteran officers are saying bye to the police department after 25 years of service? Well, uh, you're right. We do have a problem, and as has been said, we are having issues with recruiting police officers, and we got to continue to do it. we got to continue to work at that to make sure we bring people in uh, to the fold because we're seeing so many officers hit 25 years, and then they're simply leaving the, 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 the district, or the department, rather. Um, and so my plan is this. Uh, we've got so many issues uh, in our city with the homicides that we're seeing. I would like to utilize a similar sort of strategy that we're already uh, had in place with working on the issue of reckless driving, using that same sort of concept to bring retired police officers in to help us improve our clearance rates uh, when we see homicides in the city of Milwaukee. And we would use uh, some of the federal funds that are coming in in a way that goes towards law enforcement, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, use those dollars to bring those officers in to help boost our clearance rates when we see homicides and, and things like that happen in our community. All right, we want to turn uh, to our partners now at WTMJ 620 AM for our next question. Now, both of you will get to answer this question, but Mr. Johnson, you will be able to go first. And here is our news anchor, Melissa Barclay. Thank you. As we both just heard, fatal and non-fatal shootings are on record pace for 2022 here in Milwaukee. I recently spoke with a woman that lives in the 53206 zip code, and she told me that she believes mental illness and the lack of mental health care is at the core of the uptick in violence that we're seeing in the city. This is a two-part question. First, how do you view the city's role in making mental health care more accessible in low-income neighborhoods? And second, if elected, how would you propose funding those efforts? Yeah, and thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, I was on hand uh, just a few short uh, weeks ago, when, or maybe months ago perhaps at this time, when the county uh, that's in charge of mental health services and uh, those sort of things in our community uh, opened up, or, or started constructing rather, uh, a mental health emergency, emergency center right here in the city. Not out in Wauwatosa, far away from bus lines, far away from the people who actually need those services are, but right here in the city of Milwaukee. And so we'll work with our partners at the county to make sure that those services are available to the people who need them right here in the city of Milwaukee. <laughs> in addition to that, when you talk about public safety generally, look, I understand, I know, I lived in that zip code growing up, that it's not just about police. Certainly we need to have police. They are crucial uh, in our fight uh, for public safety in our community, but it's not just them. Uh, it also includes mental health services, and that's why I advocated for these crisis assessment response teams, the CART teams. Uh, it's also earlier interventions in the lives of young people. It's uh, working to stabilize families by making sure that mothers and fathers have access to family support and jobs. 
I think uh, you have to most certainly work with the state and the county. This is not just a city issue. It impacts the city, and we're seeing the results of the inability, really, on the state level and the county to deal effectively with this issue. I would agree with my opponent insofar as, yes, we need those response teams available to go out with our police officers, but not to go out individually, uh, to go out in, in addition to the police to respond to many of these calls. Those experts need to be available 24-7 and not just a nine to five uh, Monday through Friday availability that is often the case. So uh, efforts like that certainly need to be underway, uh, but you're absolutely right. The mental health issue, and, and one of the things as mayor, I would appoint a medical advisory board that could advise me on issues like mental illness. All right. Let's leave it at that. Let's move to reckless driving. It is also another concern for voters. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you've got this question. You are calling for a change in street designs and traffic enforcement to stem reckless driving. What other speed reductions would you offer or have the Department of Public Works change? Be specific. Does this include roundabouts? Does this include red light cameras? Yeah, it's an all-of-the-above strategy, Charles. Uh, listen, uh, reckless driving is probably the number one quality of life issue that people across the city face. Certainly when I'm talking to people all across Milwaukee, whether you're on the north side or the south side, east side or west side, folks are concerned. They feel like they're prisoners in their own neighborhoods. They can't drive across certain streets because of the reckless activity that's happening. So uh, I released a comprehensive plan to tackle the issue of reckless driving. It's called Stand for Safer Streets. It's an, it's an acronym. Safer street design, traffic enforcement, making sure that people who break our traffic laws are held to account, bringing in the voice of people who feel like you know they're trapped in their neighborhoods with uh, neighborhood engagement, and then working with our partners at other levels of government, such as the state of Wisconsin and the Department of Transportation there, um, to demand progress, demand that they work with us in order to bring about the safety that all of the people in the city of Milwaukee both expect and, quite frankly, deserve. Um, so whether it's uh, additional speed humps, road diets, actual protected bike lanes uh, to stop people from doing the more Milwaukee slide, uh, curb extension, and the like. I want to see it all in Milwaukee. How will you, though, hold the Department of Public Works accountable in getting uh, fast or speed up on actually doing the necessary work to get those road improvement made? That's something that many residents say. It takes a long time for city government to take change or make changes to the city's streets. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question, and when it comes to speed humps, uh, there already is a process, and so uh, in the second aldermanic district that I represented before you know, coming to the mayor's office, we installed a whole host of speed humps, uh, and it went as fast as uh, neighbors were concerned and, and communicated with our office to do that. We've also already allocated over $8 million to start making these sort of changes that I'm talking about in my plan. So uh, the Department of Public Works understands my view, understands my vision for safety uh, on the streets of Milwaukee, and they'll be working to make that happen across the entire city. All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Donovan, you're suggesting a deeper dive of a commission to review reckless driving patterns, but residents are looking for results right now. How would you prioritize effective results in your first 100 days in office? Well, I think uh, uh, certainly reckless driving is nothing new. What is new is how bad it has gotten in the last couple of years. And that's what needs to be addressed. I believe we need to send a strong message that it will not be tolerated and then back up that message with action. We need individuals who are recklessly endangering safety to be held accountable, arrested, their vehicles towed, uh, if necessary. So uh, a strict enforcement, and we need additional help for MPD to get that enforcement done. And I believe we need to reach out to the state and the county for that kind of help. As I say, we've dug ourselves into such a hole, this atmosphere of lawlessness has taken over many parts of the city. I'd also like to say I'm certainly not opposed to uh, uh, changes in traffic. No. We'll leave it right there. Okay. All right, let's move on to jobs and the economy for the city of Milwaukee. In the most recent unemployment numbers, Milwaukee was tied with Racine for the highest unemployment rate of 4.8%. Mm -hmm. Northridge Mall 
was once a destination place on the city's far northwest side. Residents and businesses in the Granville area feel like they're Milwaukee's forgotten child. The mall has been closed for nearly 20 years. City efforts to tear it down have been drawn out in court battles. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you, gentlemen, is what is your vision for revitalizing this area and unlocking the legal jam? Mr. Donovan, you'll be able to go first. Well, I think a big part of leadership is, first of all, identifying what the problems are, gathering the right people around the table, and fashioning some solutions that make sense and we can move forward with. In a situation like this, I would want to sit down with area business people. I would want to sit down with our Department of City Development. I would want to sit down with the older person in that area at this point, older woman Lewis, and see what the challenges are, identify the problems, and let's fashion some solutions. That's what, what needs to occur. I would also say this, very disappointed over the years in our Department of City Development's inability to really go out and attract businesses from other regions to come to the city of Milwaukee and settle. We seem to do somersaults if we can steal a business from West Dallas or one of our suburbs and have them settle here in Milwaukee. But Mr. Donovan, if I could follow up, you were inside City Hall for 20 years. You, you, you're familiar with what's happening up there, especially around Northridge. Uh, and I get it, you want to meet with people and talk with people, but what would you do? How would you say, you go into that situation and say, here's what we're going to do. How do you get that building either torn down or moving forward in another project that can help revitalize that neighborhood? Well, certainly I, I think at this point it does need to be torn down and start fresh and attract businesses into that area. Now, if there are legal uh, restrictions that can't uh, allow us to do that, I think we need to put all the pressure we possibly can through the city attorney's office and so on to get that done. That is prime real estate and needs to be developed. I could see a combination of housing and uh, shops and so on. We'll have to leave it there, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, there, there's so much promise on the northwest side of the city, especially in a place like uh, the, the former North Ridge Mall, if we're able to move forward there. But the fact of the matter is that the city has been mired and tied up uh, in a legal battle with the owners of the mall that uh, are based in China. And so, you know, what I would like to see is for us to continue on uh, in our offensive, uh, legally speaking, that is, uh, in order to make sure that we're in a position where uh, we can move forward with the already established raise order, tear that place down and open it up for more development. But you know, when you talk about you know, jobs and economy, generally speaking, right, Milwaukee has been mired in this, 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 this posture uh, for the past four or five decades where we just haven't had access to family supporting work, true family supporting work for the people who live in this city. If we're going to change our fortunes, not just in Northridge, but in areas and neighborhoods across the city, we need to work to make sure that people have an opportunity into our economy, a 21st century approach uh, to the economy. And I think that's what I delivered uh, when I put forward my economic development plan. So let's continue on that theme. We want to bring in our partners at the Milwaukee Business Journal for a question. Here's Editor-in-Chief Mark Cass. Good. Uh I want to talk about one thing that I often hear from our readers and from and, and from executives in the city is the need to, to draw in more individuals and companies here. So, what specific what specific action steps and incentives would each of you take to draw in a lot more people to our city? And Mr. Johnson, you'll begin. Yeah, I, I have talked about the need for this for so many reasons, not just because it's important for business, but it's, been, it's important for public safety, then there's a link uh, between the two. I was saying in my previous answer that years ago, Milwaukee had the highest quality of life for African Americans in the United States. Why is that? Because we had access to good paying, family supporting jobs in heavy manufacturing. When those jobs dried up, they went to right to work states uh, in the south or they went overseas and left those neighborhoods mired in poverty, which then leads to violence, right? So these things are interconnected and we need to work to attract new businesses and start new businesses and grow the businesses that we have here. So what I'd like to see is this. Uh, the city's raised its minimum wage to $15 an hour. 
Uh, I want to see businesses in the city, downtown and otherwise, to raise their wages as well to make sure that people have access to family support and work. I think it's also important to make sure that we not only draw in companies from the surrounding areas, but partner with not just uh, DCD, but also M7 to draw companies from around the country and around the world here to Milwaukee to create those family supporting jobs that we need in this city so badly. So follow up on that. Uh, Milwaukee Tools, the, the company coming downtown, yeah. would you have cut that deal? How would you have made the deal differently? How do you get companies to come in downtown and do you always have to offer them an incentive? Uh, Charles, we have to be competitive with cities across the country that are offering incentives. Either we're going to do that and be competitive and do it smartly and bring those businesses and those jobs here, or we're going to lose out on those opportunities and they're going to go elsewhere. Um, so did I, would I cut that deal? Uh, look, it wouldn't have gotten past the council if I weren't president. Uh, so I did cut that deal, uh, and I'm happy to bring nearly 2,000 jobs to downtown Milwaukee that are making $75,000 a year plus, and the service sector jobs were making $15 an hour. Mr. Donovan. Okay, I uh, would simply say this to answer the gentleman's question on what I would do to attract businesses. Certainly, uh, as I have mentioned previously, we need to work more aggressively in our Department of City Development to go out, seek businesses. Milwaukee has many great amenities. We need to ensure we're selling our city as best we possibly can. The negatives are what we're going to have to deal with to make it even more attractive. Another uh, effort I would undertake. Milwaukee is home to many Fortune 500 companies. We need to work with those CEOs. Every one of them has contacts all around this country. Other big business people, we need to work with them to attract those businesses. I would emphasize a buy Milwaukee first, where we, the vendors, as much as possible, are all in the city of Milwaukee. All right, well, let me follow up on that as well, because you, would Milwaukee Tool be a company you would have tried to cut a deal with and bring them downtown? Town. When do you offer the incentive and when don't you? Well, I think in each individual case, you've got to look at it separately. You've got to see what the advantages are. Uh, yes, I think Milwaukee Tool, it's a nice move downtown. So I certainly would support that. But we need to work towards Milwaukee being attractive just on its own with an educated workforce, with safe neighborhoods, and I'd like to concentrate on getting some of those jobs in our neighborhoods. I truly feel... All right, let's pick up more on jobs and the economy. Mr. Johnson, part of your economic development plan calls on the city and community partners to be equity-centered to address racial disparities. A recent MMAC survey last year showed Hispanic and African Americans were not likely to recommend the Milwaukee area as a place to live. How do you change that perception? Well, there's a number of ways to do it in terms of our own uh, contracting, in terms of lifting up businesses that are here that are owned by people of color, uh, making sure they have the access to resources they need to establish and to succeed if they're already uh, uh, operating uh, in our city. That just goes back to what I was saying before, Charles, right? Uh, those responses, those percentages from uh, people of color who live in our city aren't quite surprising when you look at Milwaukee's history and the totality thereof. Uh, again, we used to have the highest quality of life for African Americans in the country. We fall into the wayside. In Milwaukee, unfortunately, in this city, we're at the top of the worst list, worst place to raise a black child, worst uh, academic achievement gap between black students and white students, uh, worst discrepancy in home ownership between uh, white residents and black residents. You know, we need to close those gaps. And the way that we can do that is by creating stability in the lives of the people who live in our city. And that starts with a true family supporting job, where they can take care of themselves, take care of their family, keep a roof over their head, and do all the things that we're talking about here. Mr. Johnson, representation matters. So when you talk about what you have the ability to change, what will that look like in your cabinet, in your city uh, government down at city, at, at city Hall? Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about contracting, look, I, I want to make sure that when we're spending the city's dollars, when we're spending the taxpayers' dollars, that those dollars are spent right here in the city. Uh, I try to do that myself. I spend as many of the, of the dollars that I, that I earn 
right here in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, and I do it supporting businesses uh, of people of color who are right here in the city that need to scale up and have those sort of opportunities. So that's what you can expect from a Johnson administration when I'm the elected mayor, that we'll be funneling funds, funneling cash uh, and projects directly to people and businesses right here in the city. Will you also, though, be responsible in making sure that your office looks like Milwaukee, diverse? Yeah, 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 I will. Uh, I'm proud of the way that uh, my office looks, and I'm proud of what it will look like in the future uh, here as well. Look, I'm going to be uh, fortunate, uh, ho fortunately, uh, hopefully, uh, if the people were to elect me on April 5th, the first African-American uh, to be elected to the mayor of the city of Milwaukee. Uh, I want to have an office that reflects that as well. Um, and so that's what I'll be working for uh, when I'm the mayor of the city. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Uh, Mr. Donovan, we will be talking about affordable housing uh, needs in our next round of questions, but your economic plan calls for manufacturing tiny homes in challenged neighborhoods. What financial incentives would you be offering? Well, this is modeled after the uh, Cleveland co-op that was very successful in Cleveland. Again, it's something that I have argued we need to bring that to Milwaukee. Uh, sadly, um, our previous mayor and our commissioner of, of uh, city development didn't see it that way. But as mayor, that's something that certainly I would want to, to bring. And this sort of jump starts a neighborhood. When you have a situation where a neighborhood uh, is just not able to attract businesses and jobs, you need to jumpstart it with a, a plan like that. So yes, building tiny homes that can and would be utilized by uh, our homeless. I think we're killing two birds with one stone, and we're employing people and training them, and then they become owners of this building. That's the whole cons of this uh, company. All right, thank you. Let's talk about um, the city of Milwaukee and Mr. Johnson. In 1960, Milwaukee's population peaked at around 740,000. Today it's about 580,000. You envision a city with one million people. Is that a realistic goal? Given the downward trend, how would you accomplish that? Uh yeah, I think it is a realistic goal. Um, and Milwaukee, as you correctly pointed out, Charles, was on the trajectory to getting there uh, decades ago. And it all comes back to what we've been talking about throughout the course of this conversation. It, it's making Milwaukee a place that's desirable for people to come. Uh, and that includes having access to family-supporting jobs. That includes uh, making the city prosperous for everybody. That includes having a city and neighborhoods that are safe. Uh, and it includes uh, having opportunities for people uh, who go off and get educated to come back. Uh, that's why in the last term I worked with council members to uh, commission a task force, a millennial task force, uh, to have some of the best and brightest young minds in Milwaukee to come together to find ways and put forward some recommendations how the city, not just city government, but the city generally, whether you're in the for-profit space, the non-profit space, uh, to have recommendations about how to make Milwaukee more attractive so we're not having the brain drain that we're seeing, but we're bringing people in to start families, lay down roots, start businesses and add to the population of our city. Mr. Donovan, how would you reverse this downward trend? Well, I think the three pillars of my campaign are safer streets and neighborhoods, better schools, and good jobs. I believe if we're successful in accomplishing those three missions, believe me, people will want to come to the city of Milwaukee and live here, prosper here, raise a family here, get educated here. So that needs to be the direction of our city that we tackle those three major issues first and foremost, and then our city is uh, the place that it needs to be. All right, we're going to move on to housing now. All right. Mr. Johnson, your housing plan calls for off-site manufacturers to set up in the city to support affordable housing. How will, they, how will this meet the city's needs, though, for affordable housing? Uh, there are a number of things that we have in our plan to address the issue of affordable housing. Uh, in Milwaukee, there's, we're short some 32,000 units of affordable housing. Uh, and what you're talking about, Shannon, is you know, working to make sure that we have a manufacturing capability right here in the city of Milwaukee that can help uh, to mitigate that problem. But it's not just that. Uh, when I served as council president before coming to the mayor's office, uh, what we did was make the largest investment ever using ARPA dollars, uh, American Rescue Plan dollars from the federal government. We made a $43 million investment 
taking on two birds and one stone, right? The affordable housing crisis that we have here in the city, but pairing that with the fact that the city of Milwaukee owns a, a number of properties uh, that are taxed foreclosed. These properties do the city no justice. They're not on the tax roll, they're not contributing. In fact, they become drains on our resources. So we're gonna take those ARPA monies, those federal dollars, rehab those homes and sell them to individuals in our city to stabilize their neighborhoods. That's $43 million to tackle the issue of affordable housing in Milwaukee. But I do like to see if I can get more specifics. What do you mean by this off-site manufacturer? Are you talking about trying to get some company to come in here and build prefab homes, tiny homes? What are you thinking here? We've got, in addition, over we've got several thousand lots, uh, vacant lots in the city of Milwaukee that many of them uh, once upon a time used to house or have have homes on them, right? And so having you know this sort of company to come here, to locate here in the city of Milwaukee would allow us to have prefab homes to go on those lots, helping with the issue of affordable housing and also helping to make sure that we can attract the population that we were talking about earlier. All right, our next question here is also on housing. And uh, Mr. Donovan, we begin with you. Wisconsin Policy Forum found rental housing unaffordable for many in the city of Milwaukee, where the estimated 32% of renters earn less than 20000 a year. The perception is that the city favors high-end residential developers like the Couture Project. What is your plan to incentivize developers to increase below market units for those who cannot afford to live or work in downtown? Well, I think uh, certainly the first thing that I would do is uh, appoint a housing director for the city of Milwaukee. I would want them to work closely with the commissioner of the uh, housing authority, but in addition, work with the private sector on affordable housing. But again, Charles, I would mention that I, my goal would be fewer and fewer affordable houses because we have less and less a need because people are making more, they're working, they're employed, they're educated. That's wherein lies the problem, that we're not taking care of getting people out from underneath. We're not working to get them out of poverty. And that's why we find ourselves in the mess we're in. But, but wait, that, that same report, though, showed that 60 percent, 60 percent of those who live in Milwaukee are renters and they are rent burdened, meaning that even if they make over $20,000, they can't afford to put a roof over their head. So how are you going to make sure people who are working have a place to live, but it's not affordable anymore for them to live there? Yeah, I, I think there are a number of opportunities where we can renovate and work with uh, many of our developers in providing affordable housing. I've had meetings with some very committed developers that feel they can do it. Uh, we need to allow them to be creative. Some of their ideas I was very impressed with. Again, I go back to having someone in the mayor's office who's truly interested and committed to get getting the job done and then getting the right people around the table. None of us are experts necessarily. You in heard this. the beep, right? Thank right, you, Mr. Thanks. Donovan. So, Mr. Johnson, when we look at uh, it, d does downtown favor just too much the high end? How do you provide affordable housing downtown for that family making minimum wage? Yeah, that's a great question. And my answer is that I want them both. I want the high end stuff. And I want the affordable stuff. Uh, I think that downtown is big enough for both of them, and both of them should have places uh, in our city. So I was supportive of a project uh, over on Water Street that provided an opportunity for people who uh, need affordable housing to be able to live downtown or adjacent to downtown. Uh, that's why we worked uh, in the first tranche of ARPA that I was the, the, the lead sponsor on the council side before I came to the mayor's office of investing $10 million into our housing trust fund. And when we did that, when we got the council support to do that, I laid out a challenge to developers to say that if you want the city support, then work to make sure that you help to address this issue of affordable housing that we have in the city. So we've already taken a concrete step towards that with a $10 million investment to tackle the issue of affordable housing. And that can happen downtown too, but I want them both. I want the couture and I want affordable housing.
All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Let's talk about evictions. Eviction rates were common well before the pandemic here in the city of Milwaukee. What specific solutions do you have to help Milwaukee renters stay in their homes without the fear of being kicked out while striking a balance, though, between tenants and landlords? I'll start with you, Mr. Donovan. Well, in my 20 years as an alderman, Shannon, I will tell you, I have run into good landlords and I've run into bad landlords. And I have run into good tenants and I have run into bad tenants. Tenants have a responsibility to pay their rent. Landlords have a responsibility to provide the appropriate housing, maintenance, all of those things that, that are important. So. Uh, I think it's important uh, that, you know, there are certainly programs and, and uh, uh, agencies that are out there currently that are helping people who need the help, but it's also up to that individual to ensure that they're paying their rent. I have talked to a lot of landlords over the years that uh, feel at times they are taken advantage of because... Um, for whatever reason, uh, they, the city may come down hard on them uh, and not necessarily the tenant. So would you favor anything different, though, than currently? You, you, you're saying you're leaning on sort of that relationship between tenant and landlord and that there are some community uh, efforts to help. But as mayor, this is an issue, people feeling that they're getting evicted and maybe evicted unfairly. How do you change that relationship, can you, when it comes to the tenant and the landlord? Well, I've often dealt with people calling my office for help on, on a variety of issues. We put them in contact with the agencies that deal with them, and uh, I think that, you know, we need to ensure that they're working successfully, that they're being proactive, uh, oftentimes, uh, these are either at the federal level or the county or the state. And uh, sometimes they need a, a little uh, push in the right direction to get the job done for our people. Mr. Johnson. I, I think that uh, in order to address the, the, the tenant uh, issue, there are a couple of, of ways to do it. Uh, one of which is working to make sure that people who live in the city of Milwaukee, especially if they're renters, have the opportunity to have access to family supporting work. Look, folks should not be spending more than 30% of their earnings on housing, right? But in the city of Milwaukee, because we've got so many people who are underpaid uh, in the jobs that they have, we see people spending farther than that, a lot more than that uh, on housing. So that's something that we have to correct. That's why I continue to talk about the need to have true family supporting uh, opportunities for people to work at uh, here in our city. But until we get to that point, uh, it's important to make sure that people uh, on both sides of the equation are, are treated fairly, whether you're a landlord, or whether you're a tenant. And certainly, you know, there are some instances where landlords may feel that, uh, that, that they're being taken advantage of, but the same is true of tenants. Right, And so when an eviction does occur, we want to make sure that everybody has uh, equal representation in the court of law. And so we've had a right to counsel program to do that. All right, let's move on to lead laterals. It is a big issue in the city. The first question will go to Mr. Johnson. Let's talk about, as I mentioned, lead laterals. The additional federal infrastructure funding will help but not close or cover close to all of the costs, the $750 million to replace all of the city's lead lateral. So my question to you, are you committed to using additional city dollars, not just the federal money, to speed up the replacement process? Uh, listen, I, I want to see all sources of lead in our community to be eliminated, whether they're in laterals or, more importantly, if they're in uh, lead paint, uh, lead soil, and lead dust in the homes where most uh, children especially uh, contract uh, lead poisoning from. Now, there is no safe level of lead, and we should be working to eliminate that. And so I'm going to use the federal funds in order to do that. Uh, the city already has programs to uh, work to eliminate lead-based uh, laterals. Uh, I want to see the city continue to do that. But that goes you know, back to the issue that we have in terms of the relationship with state government. Uh, our resources at the local level are strained. Like M M Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee is going to be in a world of hurt unless we fix the relationship that we have with state government to take on important tasks like this. As you said, Charles, it's a nearly billion dollar proposition. We're in a troubled situation right now where we could hardly even pay for the cost for public safety and others. So yeah, I wanna see it, uh, but I gotta have the resources to pay for it. 
But the question is, will you commit to using federal dollars in your next budget if you are elected mayor towards speeding up the process to get lead laterals out of the city of Milwaukee? One hundred percent, absolutely. Mr. Donovan. I am committed to uh, addressing this issue. Currently, we're on a 70-year cycle to replace our lead laterals. That's unacceptable. I am committed to getting the funds necessary to move that up and in 10 years have this completely done. The federal government, through the, uh, the uh, infrastructure bills that they passed, we're tapping into that. We need to get more. Also, I would argue the state is sitting on a four-plus billion dollar budget surplus. We need to tap into some of that to help Milwaukee in this issue and many others. So you're saying you can get it done in 10 years? Yes. Do you, will you use if the... We have to. And, and will you use the additional COVID relief money? I believe there's going to be another $200 million. What I think everything needs to be on the table. Yes. And to use that funds and any other additional funds so that we can once and for all address our lead laterals, but my opponent is absolutely right. There are other uh, lead problems that the city needs to deal with. We just went through, not that long ago, this horrendous scandal at the health department regarding this very issue. All right, we're gonna move on to the final topic. All right. The city will be looking for your leadership on a number of skills and issues. So let's navigate through your skill set and we will start with education. Now, both of you were raised, educated in Milwaukee. How will you prioritize and lead K-12 education for all Milwaukee children? Would you appoint an education czar to promote change and bring accountability? Mr. Donovan, you begin. I believe education is absolutely critical not only to our kids' future, but the future of this city. So as mayor, I most definitely will take a much more active role in education. Public, private, charter, all education. To answer your question, I would appoint a commissioner, if you will, of education that will work and advise me on the best approaches we can take. I And I'm a a uh, big supporter of school choice. I believe that parents are the first educators of their kids. We need to provide them with the support and the choices they need to make to get the best education for their kids. As a father of five, I recognize that uh, not one size fits all. So we need to provide as many choices and support our parents. They're the first educators of our kids. Mr. Johnson. Thank you for the question. You know, I went to Milwaukee Public Schools from K to 12. Went to six different uh, elementary schools in Milwaukee Public Schools and ultimately graduated from Bayview High School. And I'm a, a father myself with uh, three children, a sixth grader uh, in Milwaukee Public Schools and d d twin daughters who just last Wednesday turned four and so they'll be going to MPS uh, later on this fall. Education is a huge uh, important issue. But as mayor of the city of Milwaukee, it's not just about MPS. Right? There are other schools and other school systems out there as well. And as mayor, you've got to have a broad scope because it's your responsibility to take care of the educational attainment and opportunities for all the kids in Milwaukee. So this is what I will do. Uh, I will work to improve the conditions on the outside before kids even enter the classroom in the first place. So if a kid is hungry before they enter a classroom, then that's something that a mayor can do something about. If a kid has trauma because of the neighborhood that they live in, that's something that a mayor can do something about. Uh, if a kid uh, has issues with violence in their neighborhood, that's something that a mayor can do something about. That's what I'll be focused on, those things outside the class. All right, we want to bring in our Marquette student here to ask a question, and we have sophomore Riley McAdams here with a question for both candidates. Okay, so I'm a student here studying political science, and I do a lot of work on campus promoting civic engagement and the importance of local elections. So this mayoral election had, or the primary had, um, a voter turnout of roughly 22%, which is very low. So how do you plan to engage a majority of voters who may not think that they have a voice in their city? 
Mr. Johnson, you begin. Uh, look, I, I, I agree totally that uh, 22 percent in uh, the mayoral primary was exceedingly low, and we should want to see more. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, this is the first time, w whether it's myself or whether it's uh, Alderman Donovan, uh, we'll be electing the first new mayor in nearly 20 years. It's not something that happens very often in Milwaukee, and so we should be encouraging uh, the citizens of this city to get up and use their voice uh, to, and exercise that uh, in this election. Uh, so my campaign is out there. We're knocking on doors. We're engaging people. We've got ads on television. We're using social media to engage with people as well. Uh, and so we'll continue to do that um, throughout the course of this election to let people know that there's one coming up um, and then also encouraging people to be engaged in the process and actually go and cast their ballots, whether they do it early uh, right now at uh, the number of sites that are currently available for early voting or whether they save it and do it on Election Day on April 5th. People need to get out and vote. This is critically important, and we're raising that uh, level to, to the people of the city right now. Well, I would agree. Uh, you know, we're working hard on our campaigns, my opponent, myself, trying to get people interested, trying to get them to the polls on April 5th. But one thing that I would most certainly do, want to do as mayor of Milwaukee, is ensure that all of our schools are teaching civics to our young people. At a much earlier age, they learn about our government, the importance of getting involved, not only in voting, but also of what it means to be a good citizen. I think that's so important to uh, in, in ensure that our young people are receiving that kind of uh, education. So just one thing that I would hope uh, we could move forward with to ensure that, uh, you know, people take an interest and uh, as they get to the voting, voting age, they want to get out and have their voice heard. Let's continue on this theme of leadership. The troubled Lincoln Hills youth detention has been a hot topic for the last few years. Our partners at WIS Politics report that the state legislature approved $42 million for a replacement facility in Milwaukee County. So yes or no, are you committed to building a facility in the city of Milwaukee? And I believe the first question will go to Mr. Donovan. Absolutely. We need that facility right here in Milwaukee County. I would prefer it be right here in the city of Milwaukee. I support the juvenile reception center that I know uh, Alderman Murphy and Alderwoman Coggs have been moving forward, working with the county and the state. I love the concept. It's been very successful in Portland. We need to implement it here. Uh, we need to ensure that we're getting involved in our young people's lives at a much younger age. Do you have a specific spot? This is 30 seconds. There are several locations, and some people have raised concerns. Do you have I don't, a... At this point, I don't have a specific spot in mind. Yeah. Would you have a commission or somebody in charge? How would you make sure you could get this done in the next year? Well, if it's a priority of the mayor, we'll get it done. And it certainly would be a priority of mine. Having said that, yes, I would want input. I would want to be uh, working with the community and, and neighborhood associations and so on. We don't want to put a burden necessarily. If a neighborhood is so adamantly opposed to it, I can understand and appreciate that. Mr. Johnson. Well, you, well I can tell you this, that no matter where you go, there are going to be folks in neighborhoods that will oppose it. Um, but I believe this, because uh, I've been to Lincoln Hills, right? I've, I've taken the trek up, and I know what it's like for a parent who's trying to work with their young person to get them on the right path, or one of our great community-based organizations trying to rehab, uh, trying to rehabilitate some of these kids so they can come back here and be productive, contributing members to society. It's a, it's a journey to get up there and to get back, you know, in a day. So would I be in favor of bringing that facility to Milwaukee? Absolutely, yes. I think it desperately needs to happen. If, if, we, are all, if we are all serious about making sure that those kids, our kids, and they are our kids, each and every one of them, if we're serious about making sure they get the rehab that they need to re-enter to society, then we have to have those services available to them locally. As he just asked, where? Uh, I don't have a particular site uh, in mind uh, right now, but I, I would be interested, and I am interested, uh, quite frankly, in working with all parties uh, necessary in order to locate the facility here in Milwaukee. 
Could I just make one quick comment? Quick. I don't want it to be replacing Thelmer's Cheney. Okay. And that would be a huge mistake because that facility does good work. We need this in addition to Mr. that. Mr. Johnson, I'll give you a chance to respond to that as well. Do you, do you have a no on that spot? Uh, oh, I, I know that uh, Thelmer's Cheney is a location that's up uh, for consideration. Uh, I don't necessarily want to see it there either. I agree that there's a lot of good work that's coming out of there. And those are you know, folks who are low-level offenders who have freedoms, and I want them to continue to have uh, that access, but it is a priority of mine to make sure that young people in Milwaukee have the opportunity to get the, re the rehab and those services right here in the city of Milwaukee. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. This question is for you. Now, you won the Common Council President's job without a single vote from an African American council member. They represent a huge block of the city. So my question for you tonight is, how will you bring unity within City Hall and the city to get the job done? Well, uh, I, I won the council presidency with at least one black vote, my own. Uh, so, uh, th so there was some African American support. But when you look at when you look at uh, the coalition that I built, it was African American. It was Latino. It was white. It was male. It was women. It was the diversity that Milwaukee is made of. And look, I know that there are some politics, some internal politics, and I understand that. I can appreciate that. But uh, when April 6th gets here, I think all of us will come and understand that there is governing to be done, that we have to move this city ahead. And so regardless of who's elected mayor, uh, whether it's myself or Alderman Donovan, who, you know, we were on the council together for a term. I know that you know there have been some love loss with me. There certainly have been some love loss with him, uh, too. Regardless of who's elected mayor, all of us understand that there's a job to get done for Milwaukee. And that's what I expect, and that's what I'll be working to make sure it happens. So, Mr. Donovan, let me ask you. You've represented the south side of Milwaukee for 20 years. Uh, in the February primary, you only carried a handful of wards on the south side. How would you promote unity among the council members and the city? Well, I think I carried more than a handful of wards uh, on the south side, Charles. Having said that, I've had the opportunity to go around this entire city in this campaign, and I am so impressed with the people I have run into, of all races and ethnic backgrounds, people who care deeply about this community and its well-being, and people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and work with the right leader in the mayor's office. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind, and by the way, I represented a district on the south side that was 70% minority, and they returned me to office five times because I got things done, and that's what what matters to most people, someone who's going to get things done. And uh, so I have no doubt that I can deal with uh, all sides of town and all races and ethnic backgrounds, and they will see in me someone who's willing to sit down and talk. When you talk about five times, let's talk about Tom Barrett. Tom Barrett was elected five times as mayor. He was Milwaukee's third longest serving mayor. What did he get right? What did he do wrong? And how would you move the needle differently? And this question goes to Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I think uh, in terms of getting things right, look, we've had a resurgence in downtown. Uh, quite frankly, a resurgence that I want to see continue because you need a strong downtown for a strong city. Uh, and so that's something that uh, the former mayor certainly got right uh, and something that all of us should be proud of because downtown belongs to all of us. It's everybody's neighborhood. But in terms of getting things wrong, when I look at the neighborhoods that I grew up in, the, the most depressed neighborhoods in Milwaukee, where little black boys and little black girls walk up and down the street and they see windows that are busted out or uh, doors that are boarded up, or they go into a, to a shop and they don't see their own reflection. Um, those are challenges that have persisted for the, the 20 years, nearly 20 years that Tom Barrett was mayor. Right? And so we've got to work to lift up those neighborhoods and create the stability in the lives of the people who live in neighborhoods like that. That's when Milwaukee will truly unlock its potential. What did Mayor Barrett do right and what did he do wrong? And what would you do different? And what would you do different? What would I do different? Okay, what did he do right? Well, he found a way to get elected five times and I never could figure that one out. In addition to that, what would I do different? I would be a leader. Tom Barrett was a very nice guy, but he swayed whichever way the wind blew. 
And I see that too often in far too many of our elected officials, including, quite frankly, my opponent. I would say this, we have had more than our fair share of politicians in Milwaukee. We need more statesmen. And the difference between a politician and a statesman, a politician will tell you what he thinks you want to hear. A statesman will tell you what you ought to hear and then be solid as a rock and not sway either way. Unfortunately, we don't have time for rebuttals, but we are going to go with the closing statement, and you get to go first, Mr. Johnson. Well, thank you so much, Charles. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, Bob, thank you as well uh, for joining me uh, here on the stage. And thank you to the people out there in the city of Milwaukee that watch this very important conversation about who's going to lead our city. Uh, Milwaukee is at a point where we've got a lot of challenges, pressing challenges that need to be solved. Uh, and I want to be a mayor that lifts this city up to make this city stronger, to make this city safer, to make this city more prosperous for everybody. I've got a goal and a vision to make this the most livable big city in the United States, and I've got the vision to get us there. It requires us to have a 21st century approach to job creation, which means we lift up and rebuild a strong middle class for the folks that represent the diversity in our community. It means that we have holistic public safety. It means that we work to grow opportunities for our population in Milwaukee to grow. If we do that, we'll create an environment teeming with safety for our families, growth for our businesses, family supporting opportunities for our citizens, and stability in our neighborhoods, which gets around to the issue of public safety that we have in Milwaukee. I'm hoping that you'll elect me on April 5th. Mr. Johnson, thank you. Mr. Donovan, it is now your turn. Okay, I would say this, folks. April 5th is decision day in the city of Milwaukee. Do we continue down the same old path, electing more of the same, the same kinds of people that got us into this mess in the first place, or do we make a change and go in a better direction? My opponent is a very good talker, but I am a much better doer. And for 20 years, I fought for the best interests of my constituents and got things done. I worked with the business community, the faith community. I will bring all those same qualities to the mayor's office. Milwaukee has many great amenities. I want to be the guy who can finally help this city reach its full potential. I'm asking for your vote on April 5th. Help me get Milwaukee working again. Thank you. And thank you both for being here. That's a wrap for the closing statements. We want to thank you both for your time and your opportunity for us to hear your opinions on the issues that matter to Milwaukee. And of course, we want to remind all you at home that early voting has already started. And Election Day is Tuesday, April 5th, to find your voting location and what is on the ballot. Of course, you can always go to tmj4.com slash vote. Now, don't forget, tonight is just one of five debates that uh, we will be broadcasting this year. There are two this summer. The first one will be hearing from the candidates in the U.S. Senate Democratic primary. That will be July 17th. And then July 24th, we will host the Republican primary debate for governor. All of the debates will be held right here at Marquette University. And next on TMJ4 News, it is a special edition of Milwaukee Tonight. We're revisiting all of the favorite hidden gems right here in our city. It is an hour to remind you of not only our mission to showcase what is important in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Tonight. And this does conclude our debate here for the Milwaukee mayoral debate. We want to thank you and thank Marquette University for this opportunity to be on campus. It's going to be a busy summer. It's a busy political year. Don't forget to vote on April 5th. That is Tuesday, and then we will have those election results on TMJ4 News throughout the day, online and on air. We, again, want to thank you very much for being here, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Donovan, and this is a good time for the audience to applaud and to thank you for being here tonight. Now, of course, we have to also thank those at home who have been watching us here tonight, Charles, and we will be back live on TMJ4 News at 10 this Sunday to kind of break down tonight's debate. Again, we want to wish all you a good night, and we also want to thank both Mr. Donovan and Mr. Johnson for joining us for many debates that you have already done through the course of this.